Ah, oh, good morning, folks. Oh, lovely, lovely. That just helps for the warm-up, doesn't it? We've got that stimulating weather out there. The sun's shining, didn't rain. It was nice to ride here and actually not get damp. Uh, but certainly invigorating temperature, isn't it? Good morning to those that are watching live. Fantastic to join with us. And I uh, hope you've got the curtains open, the heater on and the sunshine coming in, enjoying a coffee or tea, whatever it is you're doing as you partake of the LFC service. Well, I'm, I'm actually feeling quite excited because we've had, um, I've got family from Queensland, my nephew staying with me at the moment, uh, my son from Perth. We had uh, an engagement party in a community hall in Fernie Creek yesterday uh, for my son and his fiancée, and it was a lot of fun. It was just fantastic to have cousins gathering and family and a really interesting mix of people. And it, uh, it was a lovely affair, and in the end we ended up outside on the footy oval, kicking the footy and throwing the frisbee with the kids, and going home a bit muddied from the experience, but uh, warmed our hearts, and it was just a, just reminds you how important it is to gather as family and friends, isn't it? And to have those long friendships, which um, was evident yesterday, so that was a really positive experience. So as we gather, I look around this room and, and, and imagine for those that are home, there's friendships here that go back a long way. And uh, as I say, new friendships can be like silver, but old friendships are gold, aren't they? You know, where, where, where you can know the quirkiness of the other, and they know your quirkiness. And we love in spite of that. And uh, that is a beautiful thing. So um, let's raise our voices together as our... Music team, get up and and uh, and Don's got a lovely poem for us as well. So let's um, let's invite the presence of Christ with us now. Welcome, Am I on? Hello, um, welcome. Uh, as the church family here gathered today, I have a poem. I had a, a book given to me when I was eighteen called The Treasure Chest, and I was looking for something to do today to read or a prayer. And I, it was like a treasure chest of words from many poets, many famous people, um, uh, words from the Bible. It was just an interesting book to read. And today we have something called, uh, by uh, the grace of God we are. Um, that's the theme for the day. So I found a poem by Phillips Brooks called Miracle. And it goes like this. Do not pray for easy lives. Pray to be stronger people. Do not pray for tasks equal to your powers, but pray for powers equal to your tasks. Then the doing of your work shall be no miracle, but you shall be a miracle. Every day you shall wonder at yourself at the riches of your life which has come to you by the grace of God. I thought that was a beautiful poem. So, all right, we're now going to sing Cornerstone. So could you please stand as we sing Cornerstone? Oh. 
Today's first reading is from Luke chapter 7, verses 36 to 50. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who had lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii, the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned towards the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman, from the time I entered, has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured her perfume on my feet. Therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, who is this even who forgives sins? 
Jesus said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. In the church that I grew up in, the Church of Christ in Ivanhoe, we had the communion table in the centre of the platform like we do here. And engraved in front of the table was do the words, do this in remembrance of me. Like we have the stained glass, here's a bit of a focus point. The church didn't have that, but the focus was these words, do this in remembrance of me. Hands up if you can remember the first time you took communion, the first time you participated in the emblems around the communion table. Yes, quite a few of you, over half, I would think. Thinking back at these words, they've always stuck into my mind, do this in remembrance of me. But for me, taking communion for the first time was something that was bundled up with making my decision to follow Christ and to be baptised. It was a time when communion was not offered to you unless you had made that public commitment and had been baptised. So I grew up in the church watching people take communion and trying to get an understanding of what it meant. Times of change where young people in our church, we've got some here today who are now offered communion before that because of a change in thinking, and my children have too. But I'm not here to debate whether you, know, you should be offered before or after being baptised or making that public commitment. But for me, taking a communion for the first time had a lot of symbolism around it by making that commitment, standing up and declaring my faith and to be publicly baptised. And so after being baptised, part of that process was to have communion. And so I'd imagine for each one of us here, your first communion experience has different symbolism and different meaning. But each time we come to take communion, each week, we do so for one reason, and that's because Jesus said to remember him each time you eat the bread and drink the cup, do this in, remember in remembrance of me. <clears throat> And each week as we do take it and we look back at that time Jesus first shared these symbols, that was the first time we experienced communion. And Jesus, with his disciples in the upper room, took them aside and shared these emblems. And he took the bread and he said... Each time you take this bread, do so in remembrance of me. He said, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in memory of me. And likewise, afterwards, after supper, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant or the new agreement sealed with my blood. Each time you take the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So each week when I partake with communion, I often think back to those words on the table and what it meant to that first time taking communion. But in doing so, we still remember that first communion that Jesus had and he shared it with his disciples. And likewise, his disciples went out and shared it with other people. And as the church grew, many took these symbols and shared it on to the next generation. And then the next generation and so on. And over 2,000 years, these symbols have been passed down to us. And like in my first communion, someone at that church handed me these emblems and likewise 
It's been passed down to me and now on to you again today, right back from that very first time. Shall we give thanks for the bread? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for memories and what they can do. We thank you for this memory that Jesus gave to his disciples and has been passed on to us. We thank you for Jesus' life that he gave for us to, for the forgiveness of our sins and the new agreement in this bread and cup. We thank you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would the helpers come down, please? And as we uh, offered the bread, take that and eat within your own time. And then when we are offered the cup, we'll hold the cup together and drink together in a sign of our unity.
Jesus said that this cup is the new agreement made in my blood. For whenever you drink it, do so in remembrance of me. So we drink together. Lord God, once again we've gathered around this table of remembrance, these symbols we thank you. We ask that as we have taken these symbols and remember what Jesus has done for us, may we go out in his love and share with others what you have given to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, <clears throat> in a moment, we're uh, going to commission the elders that you uh, appointed and elected uh, back in May. But before that, it made me think about leadership, which uh, as we come to the kids' time made me think, perhaps it's time for a sequel to the story of Sir Gadabout and Lady Goodheart. See how she went in her newfound leadership. So I present to you the sequel. And so continues the story of the King, Sir Gadabout and Lady Goodheart. As you remember from our last episode, God had heard the cry of the suffering of the people at the hands of the selfish and mean king. He'd come down, God had come down and installed Lady Goodheart as leader of the kingdom because she had a servant heart. Meanwhile, the king had been sent to the stables where he shoveled up the manure every day and learned how to serve. And the queen she had to brush the horses down every day. So the first thing Lady Goodheart decided to do as leader of the kingdom was to care for those who were always at the castle gate. The poor, the sick, the beggars, the blind. And on the other side, the returned soldiers who were missing limbs, hands and legs and so couldn't work anymore so needed the help of others. Her first decision was to include them in the king's banquet, for every day he had indulged himself with food and with his friends. So now she invited the poor and the lame and the blind, and they came to the feast as well. And along came the returned soldiers and they were invited to the feast as well. And everybody enjoyed the marvelous display of food and drink and celebration was in order because they knew good times were coming. But Lady Goodheart realized there was one other group that was still missing. It was in fact the Ushi refugees who were still stuck in their detention camp, not knowing when they'd be released. So they were released and invited to the feast as well. The Ushis were so excited to be included, but Lady Goodheart had one more blessing for them. She took some of the jewels of the kingdom and sold them so that she could buy some houses in the middle of town so the Ushis would have somewhere to live for a while. Hooray, they celebrated, and there was much gladness in the kingdom. But she had more to offer. Lady Goodheart managed to find jobs for some of the poor so that they could earn their own money. She found jobs for them at the local supermarket, and they were so excited. New things were happening in the kingdom. And so at the end of the day, something interesting happened. Three of the people who had been given jobs at the supermarket came at the end of the day to say thank you. Two of them said, thank you for the jobs. It's wonderful to be working again. But the third woman, she was very cross. She said, no thank you to Lady Goodheart. I have been a beggar at this gate for 20 years and my father before me. I think you're just prejudiced against beggars. 
I am throwing in my job and going back to my old work, begging at the gate. And off she went in a huff back to the gate. Before Lady Goodhart could get over her surprise, along came the three returned soldiers. Two of them said, thank you, Lady Goodhart. This is the first good meal we've had in ages. But the third one complained about the food. I've never had so much fresh food in my life. Where was the roast chicken? Where were the chips? Where were the greasy, salty stuff? That was disgusting. I expect better for a free meal. No, thank you. And off they went. Lastly, some of the Ushis came over to her. Two of them said, oh, thank you for the houses. Such an expensive and kind gift. We're so appreciative. But the third one said, I have a, a bone to pick with you. I don't like a red house. You trying to force me to live in a red house? I don't want a red house. You can keep your house or give me another one of the right color. And off she went in a huff. So now at the end of the day, as Lady Goodhart thought about all that happened, as so often happens, her mind kept going back to those who had nasty things to say. And she kept thinking about it and grumbling about it and wondering how could people be so ungrateful for all the good things that they'd been given. And the more she thought about it, the more she, she didn't know what to do. And she asked God, God, how do, I, how do I keep my good heart? And God came down and said to her at that moment, Lady Good Heart, the one thing that you give to everyone is your good heart. Don't lose that because some grumble. Remember that I send the rain on the good and the bad alike. And not everyone thanks me. In fact, many people complain at me all the time. And my own dear son, who came to save people, they were not grateful for that either. So Lady Goodheart, you keep your good heart, no matter what people say, whether it's thank you or no thank you. For I love you just the way I've made you. So Lady Goodheart thought that was good advice. So she puts the negative thoughts out of her head and she praised God and she went off for a good night's sleep. The end. Can you remember who gave their opinions to Lady Goodheart about whether she was doing a good job or not? You wish she's? Yep, soldiers. Yep. And the people, yeah, who got jobs. Yeah, so that, that's, and somebody else gave their opinion. God, yeah, that's right. So out of all of those opinions, which one mattered the most? God's opinion, that's right. And that's the tricky thing about being a leader, is that whenever you're a leader, there's always people who love what you do, and there's always people who dislike what you do, and often as a leader, you, you tend to remember those who say the nasty things. Somehow it sticks, I don't know why. But the best thing to remember, even if you're a, a leader of like a, um, your sports team or anything like that, any sort of leader, then you've got to remember the opinion that matters most is God's opinion. Am I being a good-hearted person? So we're going to invite up the uh, uh, Paul Andrews and James Patterson, um, and we're going to have our commissioning now, which essentially means that we as, as God's people are going to invite God's spirit to provide everything that they're going to need as leaders, um, which includes, I guess, listening to God's opinion. <laughs> um, so, well, let's hope we do that already. But it doesn't hurt to be reminded from time to time, does it? So um, again, I'm going to invite any other elders and Vic to come up as, um, as we surround them in prayer. Now, I didn't bring this up, so I'll rely on uh, Jessica to forward that. Uh, to start our commissioning service, uh, your responses, the congregation are in blue, uh, and I'll do, say the, the black. So uh, please stand. based on 1 Corinthians 13, uh, 12. There are diverse gifts. 
There are different ways of serving God. God works through people in different ways. Each one of us has a gift by the Spirit. There is one ministry in Christ. Together we are the body of Christ. So, James and Paul, do you confess anew Jesus Christ as Lord? Do you believe that you are called by God through the church to this ministry? And relying on God's grace, do you promise to carry out the duties of your office as elders in the church council? Will you, the members of this congregation, accept these brothers in their leadership roles? Will you encourage them in love and support them in their ministry, serving with them the one Lord Jesus Christ? I just invite you to pray with me and as a a symbol of your prayer, um, you may hold out your hand if you wish uh, in this direction. Lord, we thank you that uh, you have provided uh, James and Paul in this ministry uh, and the rest of the church council as well. We thank you, our God, for the wisdom you've provided. We thank you for the, the faith that you've planted in the hearts of these, your servants. And we pray, our God, that in the days ahead, where wisdom is required, you will provide that wisdom Where courage is required, you'll provide that courage. Where the risk of faith is required, you'll provide that faith. Lord, come Holy Spirit and bless these two. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You are received, (laughs) Steph. As the pond people go out, we'll be having an offering as we sing, Father, I Adore You. with the action of this offering, we tell your story, how you have dealt generously with us, how you have met our needs, how you have heard our prayers, how your goodness is from everlasting to everlasting. Bless these offerings which are given in the name of Christ. Amen. Ah, good morning, everyone. (laughs) We've got the kids to pond. Um, Yes, welcome to everyone this morning, to those here and also those watching from home. And if you are visiting with us or joining online for the first time, a special welcome. I know we welcome Sue this morning, Loris' sister, who's come down from Queensland. So well done for getting up on this freezing morning. Uh, My name's Carolyn and I'm one of the elders here 
at Living Faith. So let's get into the community news. Firstly, uh, church life submissions are due today, which can be sent to Graham or Jacob. Now, church life is an opportunity for us to share stories, poems, reflections, prayers, storytelling to share with our LL LFC community. And we all have a story to tell, so get those in. Secondly, um, safe church training. Now, a reminder that all adult members of LFC who are on rosters of any kind or who hold a leadership position in any church group are required to have completed safe church awareness training and renew it with a refresher every three years. Now, we did want to clarify that it's not just leaders, but anyone on a worship roster. So this includes communion, Bible readers, prayers, music teams, ponds, creche. Now, this is all part of being a caring community and it's useful, useful for us all to know and to understand safety and what we can do about that. So it's not just a legal requirement and not just for leaders. It's about looking after one another in our community. So details for the dates, it's not until October, so there's um, yeah, plenty of notice. Uh, the dates and also the registrations are now open. So you can book online and also um, uh, LFC is happy to reimburse the cost for that. So any queries um, can speak to an elder or to Kate. Ladies' dinner will be at Montmorency RSL this coming Tuesday, the 21st of June at 6.30. So please let Leanne know if you're able to attend. Now, Sarah is going to come up and present the next couple of slides. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm just going to bring your attention to a couple of things coming up during the school holidays. Um, one is a craft afternoon, which is open to anybody, all ages, all abilities, all genders, perfectly welcome to come along. Now, we've got a couple of people, three of us actually, that are going to actually be running a particular craft that you can come and join. Um, if, you're got, if you're interested in those, can you please RSVP to Kate um, so that we know how many things to bring for the activity. But there's also the opportunity to just bring your own thing to do or to um, you know, join in. There'll be some other things like colouring sheets to do or just come and chat. We'd be welcome. All right, and now the next one is bugs galore. Who's interested in bugs? And it's primary school aged. <laughs> um, this fantastic holiday kids program is run at um, All Saints Church in Greensboro. Uh, there's lots of craft, fun, uh, Bible stories, songs. It's a really good activity um, during the school holidays for primary school age children. And at that one, you'll need to reply to um, Catherine. Um, she's the um, organiser at that one. The information's on there, and I think it's in the notice sheets. Yeah, in getting connected. Thank you. Uh, next, we have two theatre experiences to enjoy. So Moon is currently performing in the Gang Show, which is running from the 17th to the 25th of June. Uh, please see Teresa for tickets. And then during the school holidays from the 1st to the 9th of July, uh, Beauty and the Beast will be running. So you can see Malcolm for tickets for that. Now, if you're new to Living Faith Church or watching from home and would like to connect with us at LFC, we'd love to hear from you. So you can email the welcome at livingfaithchurch.org.au and we'll be in touch. And finally, we would like to extend a prayer invitation to you. So if this morning you are feeling in the need for prayer for yourself, for someone you know, or for God's kingdom, please come to the front after the service and someone will be here to pray with you. Now, this morning, before we come before God in prayers, I just wanted to share with you a photo. Now, this photo was taken at my parents' farm last week. Um, and it was just with the rainbow and a reminder from God that he's always with us. 
and that brings us hope. My mum um, is currently journeying through palliative care and her sister, Sue, was visiting at home. And as she left, this double rainbow appeared. And as I said, a reminder from God that he is always with us. The end of the rainbow, you can't really see, but it's just meeting with a wall there. And this is a stone wall, which my dad has lovingly built in memory of my brother, Tim, who passed away earlier this year. So it was just, it just hit me that no matter what we are experiencing or facing in life, illness, grieving, loneliness, but also in the moments of joy, peace and love, that God is always with us. So let us come together in prayer. Loving God, you are with us right now in this very moment. We take time now to welcome you in and be still in your presence. In the silence, we focus on you, each of us sharing with you the prayers on our heart. Lord, you hear every one of our prayers, each one precious to you. Thank you, Lord, for your love, grace, peace and justice, which flows abundantly from you. We pray for our world, our broken world, but also where kindness and love intersect, interwoven into the cracks of life. Your Holy Spirit weaves through every corner of the world, and we thank you. We pray for the communities where we live, our LFC community, our elders and our leaders, we thank you for the commissioning this morning of James and Paul. We pray for our school communities, workplaces. You are a part of it all. Lord, if we are feeling a little broken today, give us the courage to reach out to you for help, to share our burdens with you and to accept help from others and to remember that you are the source of our hope, love, grace, joy, and peace. In this season of winter, we'll just share a final prayer as winter trees. As winter trees stretch out bare arms to a dark sky, we stretch out in the darkness to find the touch of love. As snowdrops turn their gentle faces to the sun, we long to find in that warmth the promise of peace. As the fire breaks the shell of the seed, so may our pain break the shell of isolation that protects us from ourselves. In the security of darkness, the warmth of sunshine, the promise of fire, may we blossom anew in the miracle of your saving love, O God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our second reading for the day is Psalm 42, 1 to 8. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Where can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night. While people say to me all day long, where is your God? These things I remember. 
<clears throat> as I pour out my soul. How I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the Mighty One with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Saviour and my God. My soul is downcast within me. Therefore, I will remember you from the land of the Jordan, the heights of Hermon, from Mount Mazar. Deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All of your waves and breakers have swept over me. By day, the Lord directs his love. At night, his song is with me. A prayer to the God of my life. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, Carolyn's photo keys in very well with that psalm reading, doesn't it? It's uh, quite beautiful. And uh, I really appreciated just uh, the emotion and the sharing of uh, your entering the moment with mum and with family and that, that beautiful image. Um, I just want to say to the whole community and those that are on uh, watching live, you have got fantastic elders. Um, I remember chatting to Paul a couple of weeks ago and just realising how long he has been involved with this community and the investment that he's made. And of course, I rock up this morning on my bike and I ride up the driveway and there's James doing a lap, picking up bits of rubbish around the place. Um, he almost operates on that manic level, doesn't he, as he jumps from one job to the next around here and uh, in, in a in a wonderful way, in a sacrificial way. And you need, it's just salt of the earth people you need for a community to go well. Um, I'm gonna focus on our Luke story. It is a cracker of a story, isn't it? It is such a good story in the life of Jesus. So one of the Pharisees invites Jesus to come to his house and eat with him, which seems like a really hospitable thing to do. But as you know, the Pharisees, as a religious group, part of Judaism, they demand strict adherence to the law of Moses based on their oral interpretation of the law, which is really convenient, isn't it? We also know that Jesus and the Pharisees often clashed. And uh, once again, on their interpretations of traditions concerning the law of Moses. Therefore, I reckon the invitation by the Pharisee due to his home, is just a little bit questionable. What is the motivation that's going on here? So I'll meet it with some scepticism. Was he genuinely interested in who Jesus was? Or was this an up and coming rabbi that had a bit of a following and he was getting a little bit on the bandwagon? Or was it other? We repeatedly read about the Pharisees trying to trap Jesus in an effort to discredit his teaching or just simply to stop the crowds from hanging out with him because he attracted so many people. So as we listen to this story, I think we need to ask ourselves if the Pharisee, whose name, as we are informed, is Simon, is he trying to learn about the truth of Jesus or is he trying to find a reason not to follow him? What's the motivation here? Now, of course, there's always that little bit of contextual stuff that you may or may not be familiar with around this particular story. Uh, the way people ate, they sat at low tables, they reclined on low couches, they propped themselves up with one hand, often threw their feet behind them, and they ate with their right hand, yeah? That was what was going on here. And, and it wasn't unusual if you had a special guest, um, that you have an open door policy, and it's quite likely Simon lived 
reasonably middle-class space, maybe a bit of a courtyard that he shared with other reasonably middle-class people. And people could, when, when you had a bit of a celebrity along at your place, then you could come and have a bit of a listen of what the conversation was. But in the midst of the meal, a woman of the city, a sinner, learns that Jesus is at Pharisee's house. This woman is not just a sinner, but would seem to be a notorious sinner. How do we conclude this? Well, one, Luke records her to be a sinner in verse 37. The Pharisee notes that she's a sinner in verse 39. And Jesus knew she was a sinner in verse 48. It is strongly emphasised. So the point is that, is that the woman is not some average punter who has sinned. Everyone knows she's a sinner. And it's led many of the thinkers to believe that she was a sexually immoral person, such that everyone knows of her sexual escapades, though the text doesn't tell us this point. It seems that maybe this is why she is known for her sins. And it's interesting, isn't it? Because whether it's 2,000 years ago in Israel or whether it's in 2022 here in Melbourne, why do women work in prostitution? More than likely it has to do with survival. It's about context. It's about dysfunction. It's about some oppressive setting. It's about survival. But that's another story. What she does is completely out of the ordinary. She is, as suggested, notorious as a sinner. Uh, she wouldn't have been welcome at Simon's house. But of course, when she learns that Jesus is eating there, she brings her alabaster, alabaster flask of perfume. She enters Simon's house stands behind Jesus at his feet, and she's crying. Now, she's not just crying. She's not just shedding a few tears or a bit misty-eyed. She is bawling. How else does his feet get wet? She is bawling. That's a lot of crying, to wet someone's feet, whether she was standing or kneeling behind him. She stoops down. Wipes Jesus' feet with the hair and kisses his feet and anoints his feet with the perfume. This undoubtedly is a great act of love and an amazing act of humility on her part. Now, imagine, ladies, I can't see any blokes here who've got really any hair to speak of that would have the capacity to wipe someone's feet. Maybe Tony, 12 months ago, when he had the, uh, the new look happening, pandemic look. When I saw that, I thought, oh, that's pretty cool. You don't see that very often. And he's taken it all off. What's happened, Tony? My wife still says, don't, when I get the passive mullet going, because I grew up with a mullet. That wouldn't have been much good for wiping feet either. But imagine your hair long enough that you could uh, wipe your hair on the feet of another. Now this scene would have been just as embarrassing then as it would be now. Yeah, take off the shoes of a person wiping these dirty feet. Now of course, back then they wore sandals, it was dirty road, no doubt these feet would have been dirty. But this woman doesn't care. And it wasn't that she doesn't care about dirty feet. I don't think that's what was going on for her. There's something else happened that moves her so deeply that she would do this seemingly impulsive act. So before we focus too much on the woman and what she's doing, the story turns to Simon the Pharisee. And rather being emotionally moved by this woman and her love and her gratefulness, he is turned off. He has disdain for everything he sees. Simon doesn't care about this woman. He's not moved by the love this woman is showing Judas. This is a notorious sinner, yeah? 
maybe despicably immoral woman. We don't really know the background. But what does he say? If this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman she is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. Does Simon this act completely discredits Jesus? And now he knows for certain who Jesus is and he is certainly not sent from God. confirms all the negatives for Simon. If Jesus were a prophet sent by God, he would not let this happen. He would know who this woman is and what kind of woman she was. But of course, little does Simon realise that Jesus absolutely knows who this woman is and of her sins, whether they be notorious or not. Simon also doesn't realise that uh, Jesus is aware of what's going on in his noggin and therefore decides to tell Simon a parable. Well, the parable's pretty clear where it's pointing to, isn't it? So what do we, what do, we do with this? What is our takeaway from this story? Read this sinful woman and encounter with Jesus. And I think sometimes we... Um, We've lost our emotional response to Jesus. Like when was the last time you and I were moved by our sins like this sinful woman was? When was the last time the word of God cut through to your heart so deeply that you had an emotional response? You think about that. When was the last time? When was the last time we let our... That we, when was the... Yeah, last time we let our stuff-ups crush our soul. Do we mourn over those sins? Does the word of God still stir our souls? When the scripture was read today, were you moved by the story or was the story just a good story about grace, given that grace is our theme for this morning? This meal Jesus attended contrast two attitudes we may have toward him. One, something about the woman's expressive in her love for Jesus. Does that capture us? Is that our story? Or the other is the Pharisee who's not motivated by it at all. You know, I think it's okay for us to be emotional and allow an outpouring of what sits within our spirit. Now, we know we shouldn't manipulate our emotions or falsely generate joy or sadness about our faith, but neither should we conceal the joy when we experience the presence of Christ and therefore are conscious of his grace to us. And neither should we conceal our grief when the word of God cuts through. We need to sit with it. I reckon having emotional awareness may enhance and invite his grace more often for us. May we never get to the point that we are stoic towards Jesus and his teachings. Um, I'm a bit of a William Barclay fan, like William Barclay, and he says, the one thing that shuts a man or a woman off from God is self-efficiency. Yeah? Now, we live in a first world setting. What does that mean? We're affluent. What does that mean? It means we are very self-sufficient. We can get by without God. Have you ever travelled in the developing world? They really know how to do community. I remember sitting in a service in Palestine, a Palestinian Christian village, and watching people bringing in slabs of bottles of water and putting them up the front on a table so the brother could come out and bless it and the first thing they did was pick them up and carry them home. And what were they doing with the water? Giving them to the sick and the elderly because God had blessed the water. Now you can call that superstition. Maybe that's the way that God engages 
that brings hope and restoration, maybe healing. We are very self-sufficient in our experience of God in our setting. A sense of need will open the door to the forgiveness of God because he is a God of love and compassion and that big word that we're talking about this morning, grace. Let me just read the last bit of our text that Lynn read to us from Luke. Then he turned toward uh, the woman and said to Simon, "Do do you see this woman, Simon? Do you actually see her? I came into your house and you didn't give me water for my feet. Smack. That's the normal practice of the culture of the day. But she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. That's really different. You, you didn't give me a kiss, smack, not very respectful. But this woman from the time I've entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head as a mark of respect, smack. But she's poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, Simon, therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. But whoever's been forgiven little, loves little. You know, it's a bit like the story of, you know, being sacrificial towards someone. Easy to give something to someone when you know you're going to get something back. It's another thing to give unconditionally. Then Jesus said to her, woman, your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. Meanwhile, the guests at the door are going, what? Who's this bloke? Can he do that? Can he forgive sins? Meanwhile, Jesus just ignores that. He knows what's going on and said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Here's another thought. Um, I was chatting with Karen this week and I asked her to look at my message because I didn't feel like I was landing it. I don't know what Graham and Kathy do, but I know for a long time I'd harass Karen to read my message. She did for a bit and then one day she said, you're on your own. Find your own way. But every now and then I still harass her and she has a look. And she said, oh, it's straightforward. Three things. Oh, here we go. What do you got? You've got a self-righteous Pharisee who can't move beyond being self-righteous. He just can't. He doesn't get it. He doesn't see it. Too self-sufficient. Can't move beyond it. His self-righteousness. Then you've got... A notorious sinner. And maybe as much as Jesus forgave his sins and go in peace, did she actually change her lifestyle? Was she still a prostitute? I have no idea. And this is where I had the epiphany when Karen said, but the third thing is that it didn't matter because Jesus was moved with love and grace and he entered the moment he entered the moment and forgave anyway loved anyway showed grace anyway without any attachment to as far as we know expectation yes hope of change yes hope of the people around you will change you think about that I think about the people that drive me nuts I had a family member yesterday, didn't turn up. A little bit of a power play going on. How will I respond to this person next time I see them? How do you restore and build bridges with someone who's doing a power play? The person that just gets under my skin, how do I respond to them next? What does compassion an unconditional love and grace. What does it look like? 
What does it call me to? Jesus entered the moment and loved and showed grace because this woman did something really embarrassing because she needed, she needed a rabbi to allow her to own what was going on at that point in her life. And Jesus met her at point of need with all the judgment from Simon and all the questioning by those that were looking on. He entered the moment. And that is what you and I are called to do. That's what grace looks like. Blessings to you. Our last song today will be I Carried. It's a beautiful song and a beautiful song to end the service with. So could you please stand?
Well, folks, linger, have a cuppa, catch up. May you go in peace this week to love and serve the Lord.